pleasant morning to everyone. First of all, thank you very much, Magister Service, for the opportunity for allowing me to share my knowledge and learnings about this interesting topic for this morning. And of course, I am hoping everybody is in good condition. I hope you are in good shape and at the same time you're enjoying a very nice Sunday. And let's make this session a fun-filled learning. So let me share my presentation. The topic that was assigned to me is about innovation to teaching and learning. First of all, it was because of the pandemic, which transitioned a lot of advancements in our academic setup. If you could notice, before we are just in a traditional classroom, however, I know most of the educators here have tried a lot of things and tried a lot of strategies in order to keep a good interaction between the students as well as the teachers. But during the pandemic, we shifted to an online mode and you could see that we made ourselves adjust once again in learning how do we control or how do we utilize this teaching techniques. And now, after the pandemic, it's a very good opportunity to combine what we have learned during the pandemic to what has we have been comfortable before in the traditional learning. That's why we call ourselves as innovators because we keep on strategizing what would be best for our students in order for them to learn. Learning through interactivity. An interactive learning is one that requires the student's participation. So it can come through a class or a small group discussion, as well as through exploration of interactive learning materials they are given in a digital classroom. At the same time, this is an educational approach which emphasizes engagement. Can the students focus on us? Can the students participate well, not just with what we're saying, but also with the other learners inside the classroom and at the same time there is an active involvement of the learners as we go along with the learning process and this approach recognizes that individuals often learn more effectively when they are actively engaged in the material rather than passively receiving information so it's very essential that we allow our students to think about what was the lesson all about and not just merely confining themselves with what is being presented in the textbook or any of our learning aids, but at the same time, they have to think critically as to how they would be applying it in their everyday life. And at the same time, how could they become more resourceful in figuring out different trends and different technology so that they could more utilize what is readily available for them. So here are some of the key aspects of learning through interactivity. First is the active participation. Interactivity encourages learners to actively participate in the learning process. That's why there are instances that we just do not give lectures course every day of our lives as educators it's really our role to impart this knowledge however we have to make it more interesting like for example we assign group activities to students another hands-on projects projects which are related to your lessons or your topics of course you should not be deviating from them and most importantly we have to be resourceful enough how do we make interactive exercises like, for example, in discussing the parts of the body for science classes, of course, right now there are a lot of videos, interactive videos that you could download through the internet. You do not just say this is the nose, this is the head, this is the ear. But in that interactive video, you could really present 
the parts of the body in a more engaging way. And at the same time, the visuals could be more appealing to the students. And most importantly, retention would be better if they are very much interested in what they're seeing. Next is the engagement. Interactive learning methods aim to capture the learner's interest. Like for example, of course, a continuous one hour of lecture would be boring for the students, right? So in between, we have to make them engage. You start by asking how are they in order to establish your rapport with each other. And in between the lectures, try to insert some examples into which they could relate. You have to know where they are much likely interested with. Like, for example, if you're dealing with kids, what kind of cartoon could you connect with your lesson? What kind of K-drama or K-pop or names of their favorite characters? You have to win their hearts so that you could still make them engage whatever kind of lesson you are discussing with them. Also, engagement is enhanced through a quality multimedia presentations, a gamified elements. So you put tests into games or you try to make exercises that would involve class participation into which you'll be dividing them into groups and they would be competing with each other and a real world application of the concepts. Next is collaboration. Interactivity often involves collaboration with peers, group discussions, collaborative projects, and team-based activities foster a sense of community and shared learning experiences. Let them share their ideas. Let them share their thoughts. Let them discuss it throughout their groups. But do not just let them discuss by themselves. Of course, you have to move from one place to another. You have to visit each small groups and try to monitor what is going on with the class. Like for example, okay, what's the progress of this group? What have you agreed? How do you think are you going to present it? Is everybody participating? Okay, and of course, as they exert their effort, you have to give your feedback. The students will like to hear the results of what they have worked on. And this is a very crucial aspect of interactive learning. They can receive feedback on their performance. Of course, we say it in a constructive way. Of course, we try to begin with telling, this is how I see what you have presented. What I like with your presentation is that, then enumerate the ways. And instead of saying, this is wrong, this is not right, you could say it in an even nicer way. Next time, it could be like this. Okay, or you might even ask them, what do you think could be a better way of presenting this? Right? And then later on, all in all, you could tell them, this is a good job. At the same time, here are some of the things you need to work on once again in order for it to become better. Of course, this involves problem-solving skills to allow them to make corrections and improvements in real time. Okay? Next is adaptability. Interactive learning can be adaptable to different learning styles and paces, and learners can progress at their own speed, explore additional resources, and choose pathways that align with the preferences. Of course, there could be instances that you think this method is not very much applicable then you have to tweak it to something that would be more appropriate. At the same time, even if you are teaching the same subjects, for example, you're teaching uh, introduction to psychology to three sections, it doesn't mean that all your activities should be the same all throughout the classes. Why? Of course, you have to know the characteristics of your students. You have to know what would be very interesting for your students to make it a very more 
enhancing learning and to make it more engaging. Next is technology integration. We do not just limit ourselves by using uh, Manila paper or cartolina. This time we make use of PowerPoint presentations and our students are very bright. They have this knowledge of utilizing different platforms where they can express and present the outputs that you assign to them. Actually, sometimes they're even better than us because they do really nice designs. They do really download great videos and they are more advanced in technology. And in integrating technology, simulations, virtual reality, interactive multimedia tools could provide a dynamic and engaging learning environment because the students will really feel that they are into the learning process. Next is critical thinking. Interactivity encourages learners to think critically, analyze information, and apply knowledge in practical scenarios. Problem-solving activities and case studies are common elements in interactive learning. Of course, they have to learn how to think critically, not just solely basing on what they have read. They have to think of more encouraging ways as to how they would make themselves more creative and resourceful about things. And next is retention. Actively participating in the learning process enhances retention. Learners are more likely to remember information and concepts that they have engaged with, discuss, or apply in various contexts. That's why when they put themselves into the learning process, they remember it more. Like for example, you give a situation. Like for example, you ask the question, imagine you are walking with a friend in this street and you have noticed that there are some people who are trying to call you. Instead of saying, imagine you are walking with your friend, your friend could be renamed as somebody popular to your students. Imagine you're walking with Jungkook or you are walking with um, Naruto, right? The favorite anime or the favorite characters, the favorite idols of the students. If you put it there, later on when the students think, ah, this is the one that mom or sir had mentioned when I was walking with this, when I was walking with Jungkook, when I was walking with Naruto, they might be thinking, I could remember it more. Okay, so you have to make it a fun field, lecture, or activity. And of course, another is real-world application. Interactive learning often emphasizes the application of knowledge in real-world situations. With this, it makes the learners understand the practical relevance of what they are studying, not just the theories. They have to clearly know why is it important to know this? Why is it important to study this? How can I apply it in my everyday life? How can I apply it in the normal scenario that I'm having? And when they see that, oh, that's why it's important to know this, it's because I could use it here. It's because I could apply it here and it will be very helpful if I do it here. Okay, so when they see that it's really essential in their life, then of course they will try to remember it. Next, methods and techniques. Here are some of the examples of interactive learning methods. Like what I have said, group discussions. Take a look at the illustration. It's not just the teacher who is speaking, but you involve the students in discussing things or discussing topics that will make them also more engaged. It's not just making them more engaged, but we also teach the students here to be more confident, to be more confident in speaking, to be more confident in expressing themselves, to be more confident in presenting themselves in front of other people and to speak what's on their mind. Okay, case studies. 
case studies allow for a comprehensive understanding and a comprehensive discussion of a certain topic or a certain scenario that they have to know more about. And simulations, it's like you put yourself in the actual event of a particular situation with the use of like virtual reality, role playing, interactive quizzes and collaborative projects. I know you're very much familiar with the use of Kahoot, isn't it? You prepare questions, they are flash on the screen. The students may also take use of their mobile phone so that they could put their answers. And from there, you could easily see who were able to get it right, who is leading, and at the same time, how many got a wrong answer. And that's easier to continue for the discussion. In Incorporating various forms of interactivity can create a dynamic and effective learning experience for individuals with diverse learning preferences. One of the examples, again, is an enhanced lecture. This is a broad category which encompasses a range of interactive learning strategies in the classroom. So basically, an enhanced lecture could, could look very similar to a traditional classroom. However, it's an enhanced lecture because we make use of interactive learning tools that allow instructors to ask students frequent questions throughout. Okay, and these tools would include response technology like Turning Point, and it allows instructors to poll their classes frequently. Again, the poll, okay? give immediate feedback, and even facilitate small group discussions. Oh, for example, okay, class, what is your idea on the following topics, A, B, C, and D? Which do you think is the most appropriate among all of this? And you tell your students, just press this, press A if you think this is the one, press B, press C, or press D. In an instant, in an instant, you hear the voices of all your students by taking a look at the poll results. It's like you're getting a survey, and from the survey, you understand what do they think about a particular question you ask from them. Next is a flipped classroom. So, Traditional classroom, the instructor prepares materials to be delivered in the class, while the students listen to lectures and other guided instructions in the class and take notes. And the homework is assigned to demonstrate understanding. This is done after the lecture has been delivered. But in a flipped classroom, instructor records and share lectures outside of the class. That's why we have a, like a virtual classroom. We're in, that's where you upload the lectures and record them. The students watch and listen to lectures before coming to class. And the class time is devoted to applied learning activities and more higher order thinking tasks. So take a look at that. You assign the students or listen to this lecture while you are at home. Once we are in school, we will be having activities to carry out. If you could notice, it might save time, okay? And at the same time, especially if you're having laboratory classes, it allows you to maximize your time to focus on the experiments because we know that experiments might take more time when we conduct it. Another, if there are practical applications that you want to demonstrate in the class, then you have more time in carrying that out once you have already assigned the lecture but you have to make sure that the students will be really devoting themselves into listening and studying the lecture which you have provided and here students receive support from the instructor and peers as needed that's what we call as a flipped classroom next is a peer instruction Collaboration among students is a big part of building an interactive learning environment and peer instruction is one great way to encourage it. This technique involves 
lecturing for a short amount of time and as in enhanced lecture periodically asking their students questions about the subject matter and while the students initially answer the question on their own they meet in a small group to discuss the question and answer choices and by the end of the process the students have a better grasp on the correct answer and a more depth or more in-depth understanding of the subject of the lesson it's also a great way to uh, make the students feel very comfortable with their classmates we also help them to develop the social self as they interact with students or their classmates and share their thoughts and their knowledge they would also be able to communicate in a better way they would also learn how to respect each other's thoughts and opinions even though they know that they are bright they are good they would be open for suggestions some ideas and some thoughts by their other classmates and they will have this sense of unity as they strive to consolidate and combine their thoughts to make it into a more meaningful one then we have the team-based learning this is a collaborative strategy designed around modules of instruction thought in a three-step cycle the following are the steps preparation in-class readiness assurance testing taken first individually and then as a team and an application focused exercise that the team works to complete during the class the team-based learning is an effective way to build a collaborative learning environment no matter the class size and of course technology is often utilized to facilitate the readiness assurance test so that everyone can see results quickly okay you could notice that in this innovative teaching techniques one of the main importance is the readiness of the educators to make themselves abreast with the current trends in teaching we do not just say i'm old enough i don't know how to make use of this computer i don't know what kind of software should i be using the most important thing is that we are open to learning new things so that we could serve better our students by utilizing very much interesting learning techniques and you will notice that it will also help you develop yourselves to become better individuals so here are importance of active learning first is engagement and motivation it captures the learners interest and maintain their motivation by involving them directly in the learning process of course when you are directly involved you feel yourself you feel the lesson retention is very much noticeable here hands-on activities discussions and interactive exercises create a dynamic and engaging learning environment at the same time next is deeper understanding it active learning it encourages students to actively process and apply information and this leads to a deeper understanding of their concepts engaging with the material through various activities will help the students make connections and see real world applications. Then we have critical thinking skills. Active learning promotes the development of critical thinking skills by requiring students to analyze information, solve problems, and make decisions in real time. Okay, another is the retention of knowledge, which we have mentioned earlier. The more they apply it in a normal scenario or in practical activities the more these concepts are stored and converted into a long-term memory at the same time learners are more likely to remember and recall information that they have actively engaged with even with us educators whenever we attend trainings whenever we feel oh this is the part that i have recited this is the part which i have read this is the part which i have played 
And so you remember that all throughout. This is a part which gave me so much difficulty. If you could remember when you were still studying, of course, there are topics which are our favorites and there are topics which are very memorable to us. There are also teachers who become so memorable to us that even the way of teaching that they have is somehow being copied or imitated by us, right? Next, the collaboration and communication. Many active learning methods involve collaboration among students, fostering effective communication and teamwork. And group discussions, projects, and interactive activities provide opportunities for students to share ideas and learn from each other. Then, preparation for real-world changes. Active learning would mirror real-world problem-solving situations, preparing students for challenges they may face in their future careers. At the same time, a practical application of knowledge helps bridge the gap between theory and practice. And most importantly, personalized learning is one of the importance that active learning gives. Why? Because the students can explore topics at their own pace, engage with various learning materials. And like, for example, you utilize a flipped classroom. You have a compilation of your lectures there. You could even access that even when you are at home. The students could review that again and again and again. And at the same time, you yourself could improve how you deliver it more. So you could see what well, this part of information could be having additional examples. And then you could prepare a supplementary discussion on that to give clarifications. And the students, once they have access to it and they are very devoted in learning, of course, they will try to listen to that again and again. And it would enhance their learning. For other students, they like it when before sleeping, they listen to the lecture which was given again so that they could more or less be more familiar with what the discussion had been. That's why if you could notice when we utilize the Zoom or the Google Meet or any other online learning platforms, the students would be requesting if they could record the session. Okay, sometimes we do not like it at first, right? But if you come to think about it, there is a good reason why we make a recording and a compilation of the lectures that we do. It could also be a database of your lectures, which could also help you in the future so that it could be a good thing for both of you as well. Next is adaptability to diverse learning styles. Active learning methods can be adopted to cater to different learning styles and preferences, making education more inclusive. Various activities ensure that students with different strengths and preferences can find ways to excel. Of course, like what I have said, learn about your students, know their likes and their dislikes. And as you know that, you'll be able to identify where they are weak at. And from identifying where they are weak at, you are also able to identify what kind of activities would be best. So I could help them turn these weaknesses into strengths. And next is lifelong learning skills. It instills a love for learning and encourages a mindset of continuous improvement. Skills developed through active learning are very valuable in aspects of life and in adapting to evolving challenges. It's not only for the students. You could notice that as educators, we never stop ourselves from learning and discovering new things. We try to learn different strategies in thinking or in learning and in teaching. We put ourselves into the strategies at the same time, we help each other to become more familiar of what is in or what is the trend for our students. And preventing passive learning. It's not just like, okay, get inside the classroom, I'll deliver the lecture, I'll give you a homework and you could go. Then that's it. Of course, it's not like that. Because in active learning, we put our students into the learning process by 
making them feel and including them in all of the aspects of the learning process. Okay, we tend to minimize disengagement here and limited retention. And at the same time, we require active participation. Okay, so I hope these things are clear. Now, as we continue, we could see here the shift from textbook to ebook. May I know who likes reading textbooks? Or who likes to read ebooks? In the chat box, you could type textbook or ebook. Which one do you prefer? Which one do you find more comfortable? Okay. If you're going to ask me, I like textbooks because they are printed. However, there are available sources in the internet in the form of ebooks and sometimes of course you don't like going out because you do not have enough time so you just download it however what i do with what i download is i try to print because i am more comfortable with reading in a paper than in screen or than in the phone so i try to print it but i think both are very useful okay the shift of from textbook to ebooks represent a significant transformation in the way educational materials are consumed and delivered. And this transition had been fueled by advancements in technology and offers several advantages. So, ebooks are often preferred over traditional textbooks for a variety of reasons, right? In the example I've given to you a while ago, in my case, of course, accessibility. So just download it, right? So despite the advantages of e-textbooks, including interactive features, accessibility on mobile devices, yes, because anytime, wherever you are, if you have your saved ebook in your phone, you could easily download it, you could easily open it, and you could read it anywhere you want. Right? The availability of digital alternatives, the questionable effectiveness of the ebooks being used, the consistency of state textbook affordability initiatives, and the unclear role of the instructor in adoption of e-textbooks in the courses. Now, why is ebooks or why are ebooks now a preference over textbooks here are some of the reasons accessibility and convenience anywhere you are like what i have said it's very advantageous especially for students who prefer remote learning or online learning it enables them to study in various devices at the same time it's portable you don't have to carry many books heavy books because they are just stored in your devices and you always bring your phone with you. For others, they have their tablets. For others, they have their laptops. And whenever they bring those gadgets with them, it contains the files that they need, right? Actually, in portability, students could carry an entire library of digital resources in a single device, right? I think it's not only the students, but even the educators. I believe that many of the educators here have their ebooks compiled in their devices. Am I right? And like, for example, you are passing time, you try to open some of the ebooks and you make use of the time so that you could learn new things by reading and you could say, I have already read this and I could combine this with the lectures that I'm going to have. Next is cost effectiveness. Why cost effective? You could download it. Some ebooks are for free, right? You don't have to pay for it. But if you will be getting a textbook, of course, you have to buy it. And we know that textbooks are quite pricey depending on what is needed or what title it is. Digital copies eliminate printing and distribution cost. And in some cases, ebooks can be more available and free. Searchability and efficiency. Ebooks allow for quick and efficient searchers within the text, and students can easily locate the specific information 
keywords or topics saving time compared to flipping through pages in a traditional textbook. Here you just have to click control F. You type the word that you're looking for and your device will scan all throughout that particular word and it's easier, right? It's like you could easily get it like a bookmark. Next, interactivity and multimedia integration. Ebooks often include interactive features. And we have said interactivity. When we make things interactive, we allow the active participation of the individual. Hyperlinks, like for example, there is a word human body. And human body is underlined. When you click it, it will direct you to a video about human body. Or it could direct you to a picture about human body. Right? Quizzes. Or here are sample tests that you could utilize in preparation before you jump into the next chapter. And simulations. This interactivity enhances engagement and provides a richer learning experience compared to a static printing material. And of course, we are visual learners, right? Next, customization and personalization. Ebooks offer customization options such as adjustable font size, annotations, highlighting, and students can tailor their reading experience to suit their preference and their learning needs. Real-time updates. Ebooks can be updated in a real time, allowing for the incorporation of the latest information and advancements. And this is particularly beneficial in fields where knowledge is rapidly evolving. Next, environmental impact. Of course, you could save paper, right? There's no need for a printout, especially if you're fine reading and your gadget there are also some features that allows you to highlight some of the text in your ebooks and if you lessen the use of paper it lowers the environmental impact associated with traditional printing and distribution at the same time collaboration and learning students and educators can share digital resources collaborate on annotations comments that are given uh, additional supplementary learning materials could also be incorporated. And at the same time, there are parts which you could give your comments, right? And even when you are not face to face, when you are away from each other, even not during the class time, there could be continuous discussions in the forum or in the comment section. And you could see active participation of the students over there. Another, multimodal learning. Ebooks can accommodate different learning styles by incorporating various forms of media, such as videos, images, interactive graphics, and this supports a more diverse and inclusive learning experience. You don't just seeing text, you're seeing pictures, you're seeing videos, you're seeing thoughts of people, you're seeing dates of updating it, and space saving, it do not require a physical storage space, or a physical storage space, and the students can have access to a vast library of digital resources without the need for bookshelves or storage cabinets. And then here we have global availability. Ebooks can be distributed globally without the challenges associated with shipping physical books. Like in our case, in the university, we have the special lectureship program where we, and we invite professors from other countries to teach online our students. And these professors are being paired with a Filipino professor, a Filipino counterpart. They do team teaching. The lecturer abroad is the one responsible for delivering the class discussions, while the local faculty is the one in charge for giving examinations, computation of grades, and coding of grades. And what is good about here is that 
references or learning materials are being also shared by the lecturer abroad, not just to the students, but also to the partner professor. And with that, they could share different knowledge without physically sending the book. We'll just give a link or a downloaded file. And they would share this learning materials for discussion. And the students could gain access to it. Even having a greater perspective of what is going on outside the globe. Okay? Next, we have learning skills via line simulator. Learning skills via line simulation involves using virtual simulations. If you could see this, right? This is very much useful in laboratory activities as well. Or scenarios that mimic real world situations to help individuals develop and enhance specific skills. Line simulations provide a dynamic and interactive way for individuals to acquire and refine skills related to specific processes or tasks. By replicating real-world scenarios, the learners could actually feel that they are within the content, making the learning experience more effective and practical. As you could see here, there is a screen, there are some devices that the student is holding and the professor is supervising her and here there is like a virtual box that covers the eye so that the student feels that she is really in the environment and there could be some sensors there could be also some responses to how you move across over here Okay, line simulation is designed to help learners understand and navigate through a series of steps, procedures, or events. Here is how it's implemented. Of course, first of all, the teachers here must be very knowledgeable about how to use the software, about how to use the gadget. And the professor or the teacher should have also tried utilizing it before he or she teaches the students. First, training and onboarding. Scenario-based learning, in this one, this could be used in training programs to guide learners through realistic scenarios. For example, a new employee could go through a line simulation representing the onboarding process, introducing them to various tasks and procedures. Next, process understanding. It's a step-by-step -step learning. Line simulations can break down complex processes into manageable steps. Step one, step two, step three. Learners can progress through simulation, gaining a deeper understanding of each stage and the sequence. So the students will have a, a greater retention of what to do next before because of the step-by-step -step procedures that must be observed. And then skill development. In the fields that involve specific procedures or protocols, line simulations can help learners practice and develop the necessary skills. This might be relevant in healthcare. So this is one of the thing here. If you're trying to take a look, for example, exploring the abdominal area, right? In your line simulation, you're holding some gadget and it's like you are getting inside the abdominal area. And you utilize your virtual eye cover together with the gadget you hold with your hand. And in the screen, you see that you are getting inside. Okay? Technical training, welding at the same time, robotics, or even manufacturing. Software and systems training. Code execution simulation for programming or software development courses. A line simulation could involve simulating the execution of lines of code. Learners can follow the flow of the program, understanding how different lines contribute to the overall functionality. Next is decision-making scenarios, interactive decision points. Line simulations can incorporate this decision points where learners must make choices influencing the direction of the simulation and this fosters critical thinking and decision making skills also 
career development. We have career path simulations in educational or career planning context. Line simulations can represent different career paths. Learners can explore the sequential progression of skills and experiences needed for various professions. Next, project management. We have project workflow simulation. For project management training, line simulations can replicate the workflow of a project. Learners navigate through planning, execution, monitoring, and completion stages. Also, we have virtual labs, virtual laboratories. Scientific experiments could be conducted here. In science education, line simulations can simulate laboratory experiments and the learners can follow a sequential process flow conducting ritual experiments and observing outcomes next is the customer service training service interaction simulation it can be used to train individuals in customer service guiding them through various stages of interaction with customers it's like they are talking with somebody and that person asks things and they are being trained how to address them appropriately and how to deal with different scenarios next is language training the simulations can represent different proficiency levels learners progress through activities and assessments to advance along the language proficiency line. Next, focus on accessible education. Of course, learning should be inclusive. At the same time, it has to be open to different diversity. Accessible education is the process of designing courses, developing a teaching style to meet the needs of people from the variety of backgrounds. Either that person belongs to an indigenous group, or that person belongs to a tribe, or that person belongs to a different origin. Abilities, if that person is a person with special needs, a person with difficulty, in some areas and at the same time the learning styles it refers to the provision of educational opportunities and resources in a way that removes the barriers and resources to ensure that all individuals regardless of their backgrounds ability circumstances will be having the opportunity to learn and participate in educational process. And this is one good thing. It lessens discrimination. It also offers opportunity for learning and having a better life for, for people with special needs. So this is a critical aspect of creating an inclusive and equitable society. This involves the following aspects so that we could consider it as an accessible education first is the physical accessibility when we speak of physical accessibility the first thing that will come into our mind is the infrastructure so here we have to ensure that educational institutions should have facilities that are physically accessible to individuals and with mobility challenges like having a ramp for those who would be in wheelchairs elevators and other accommodations even handles like for example in toilets in um, staircases or in the stairways right next is the digital accessibility ensure that the digital platforms and educational materials are accessible to individuals with disabilities. This involves providing alternative formats, caption, and screen reader compatibility for online content. Next is the inclusive teaching practices. Diverse learning styles, educators should employ teaching methods that cater to diverse learning styles. This may involve incorporating visual, auditory, and kinesthetic elements in lesson. Another is adaptive technology. When we speak of this, 
It's the assistive devices. We have to utilize adaptive technology and assistive devices to support the students with disabilities. Like for example, the braille that could be incorporated with technology, like screen readers, magnification software for those who have problems with vision or other tools that enhance accessibility. Even for like for students who could not hear, right? It should be something that would be good on their visuals if they are not able to hear it. Or if they could not see it, it has to be something good for their auditory so that somehow they could understand it at the same time. Another is flexible learning options. Blended learning. You could offer a mix of in-person and online learning options to accommodate different preferences in its situations. Like for example, in PUP, since we have the flexatel or the flexible technology of learning, it started during the pandemic. Of course, during that time, it was purely online. And this time, there are days that the students and the teachers would agree. Of course, for example, in a month, you will be having four meetings, like once a week, for example, in a three-hour class per week. For a month, it could be two meetings will be done physically and two meetings will be done online. It gives an adjustment for both of the students and the teachers in having this there could be a synchronous and asynchronous classes at the same time okay next is financial accessibility of course it has to be affordable we have to address financial barriers by providing scholarships this is one way of bridging the gap for the digital divide scholarships financial aid or low-cost educational materials of course it's not only the books we are talking with that's why this time some local government units donate tablets, donate uh, Wi-Fi accessibility tools so that the teachers and the students would be able to utilize the online technology also and utilize those gadgets for remote learning. Ensuring that education is financially accessible promotes inclusivity. Next is cultural sensitivity. Diverse perspectives incorporate diverse cultural perspectives into curriculum to make education culturally sensitive and inclusive. Of course, we have to be respectful of the differences that we have because we are individuals coming from different backgrounds. And with that different backgrounds, we have different values we have different culture we have different beliefs and we have different practices some of our practices could be not acceptable to other sects and some of their practices could not also be acceptable to us but the key thing here is we have to make everybody feel accepted valued represented and most importantly appreciated Language accessibility, multilingual support. Of course, for institutions with foreign students, we should provide support for individuals who speak languages other than the primary language of instruction. And this can involve offering multilingual resources or language assistance services. For other institutions, they have a gadget, a translator, you'll just place it on your ear. And when somebody speaks a different language, automatically there is a translation that could be heard real time with the language that could be understood. I've experienced that when I was in China because most of the speeches were delivered in Chinese. They have a translator that you'll just put here on your ear and this will be translating what is being said in the lectures in Chinese and then the language I'm using was English. Um, so accessible assessments, varied assessment methods, use a variety of assessment methods to cater to different learning styles and abilities. This may include alternative formats for examinations, alternative assessment that measure understanding in diverse way. And here we have inclusive policies. 
anti-discrimination policies implement and reinforce policies that prevent discrimination based on race, gender, disability, or any other characteristics. Because with this, you could ensure a safe and inclusive environment, which is crucial for accessible education, universal design for learning, flexible curriculum, apply UDL principles to design a curriculum that is flexible and can be customized to meet the needs of diverse learners. This includes providing multiple means of representation, engagement, and expression. Next is community engagement. We have to collaborate with communities. That's why most institutions or most uh, academic institutions have their extension services. They engage, partner, and collaborate with local communities and involve them in educational processes. Like in PUP, there is what we call as um, a transfer of knowledge, salin kaalaman wherein a group of professors will be assigned to a certain community nearby and there are sessions that they conduct teaching a group of people, not just students, but even like mothers or fathers, depending on what topic will be delivered so that they could transfer learning and transfer knowledge for the individuals in a community who could have limited access to some proper education as well. This fosters a sense of community and helps address specific needs and challenges faced by the learners. Next, accessibility training. This provides training for educators on inclusive teaching processes and the use of accessible technologies. This ensures that educators are equipped to create on an accessible learning environment. So, educational institutions can work towards providing an inclusive and accessible learning environment for all, fostering a society that values diversity and promotes equal opportunities for education. We have here equality, accommodation, and accessibility. So I do hope that with each of the institutions, more or less, you could somehow feel many of the things we are discussing. And there are some, of course, innovativeness that is being applied in the setup where you are working with. Next, higher measurability of learning effectiveness. To achieve higher measurability of learning effectiveness, institutions and educators can implement various strategies and employ tools that allow for more accurate and comprehensive assessment of the student progress. So uh, measuring learning effectiveness involves using various methods and tools to assess the extent to which educational objectives are achieved. We should always remember that not all of the aspects of effective teaching are immediately visible or measurable. We have to wait. We have to take like some time. We have to give investments. We have to observe if this is really working for a period of time. Of course, we need to plant something first. And when we plant that, it doesn't grow overnight, right? It grows with some forms of nurturing. It grows with some forms of culturing. It grows with some of patience. Before we are able to harvest the fruits of our hard work and effort. Same thing with teaching. Okay, effective teachers cultivate excellent working relationships with their students within safe and respectable environments. Effective teaching is much more than end of a year data. It is an ongoing reflective practice that needs to be refined and amended to suit the learner's needs. So the purpose of enhanced measurability in effective learning is multifaceted and extends to a various stakeholders within the educational system. The first one 
is institutional improvement. Measuring learning effectiveness, provide data that institution can use to identify areas of strength and weakness. This data-driven approach allows for targeted improvements in curriculum, teaching methods, and student support services. Next, quality assurance and accreditation. We have to ensure that our curriculum, our teaching materials, our grading system are at par with the standards being set by our Ministry of Education. Okay, we have to maintain standards all throughout. Enhanced measurability helps universities, schools demonstrate and maintain a high academic standards. That's why we allow our programs to be put into accreditation, right? Although it could be tasking for the teachers, for the students, for the administrators, that's one of the importance of subjecting our academic programs to accreditation and this is very crucial for accreditation processes because we tend to check if our educational programs align with the established criteria and industry benchmarks next is optimizing teaching and learning strategies tailoring instruction measurable data allows educators to understand how students engage with different learning materials and assessments this information enables instructors to tailor their teaching strategies to accommodate diverse learning styles, improving overall instructional effectiveness. Next, student-centric focus. Measuring learning effectiveness is ultimately about ensuring that students are acquiring the knowledge and skills they need for success. By identifying areas of improvement, Institutions can implement interventions and support mechanisms to enhance student learning outcomes. Right? Next, resource allocation. Measuring effectiveness helps institutions allocate resources more efficiently, like in a government setup. The budget that you will need for next year has to be placed a year ahead. So, in case you were not able to put that. It's a bit challenging to request that for that year or you might be needing to request for a realignment of your budget so that you could utilize it with a particular need that you have. Because identifying successful programs and practices, universities can allocate resources to initiatives that have proven an impact on the learning outcomes, right? Like, for example, um. You could notice here that in this case, a funding for subscription to ebooks is increased during 2024. Now you have to assess do we have to increase the budget of downloading ebooks or subscribing to ebooks the next year? Will there be a lot of great advancements? or greater improvements, advancing trends. That's why we need to increase the budget for subscription of ebooks the following year. Then that has to be included too in your allocation of the resources. Another, what kind of facilities do you need to work on with? Is your classroom still conducive for the learners and the teachers or you need to do some renovations? then also include that in your resource allocation. Next, demonstrating return on investment or the ROI. Measuring learning effectiveness allows educational institutions to demonstrate accountability to students, to parents, to funding agencies, and other stakeholders. This is particularly important as stakeholders increasingly seek evidence of the value and impact of educational investments. Then, continuous improvement culture, adopting to change, enhanced measurability fosters a culture of continuous improvement within educational institutions. 
you have to recognize the importance of assessing learning effectiveness which encourages responsiveness to change in technology. We do not just stick to what is being used today and what should be used five years from now, right? Teaching pedagogy, that's why we tend to make revisions of our curriculum, updating of our learning syllabus, updating also resource materials for the topics that we utilize and industry demands and preparing students for the future measuring learning outcomes ensures that educational programs remain relevant and aligned with the evolving needs of the industry and the society and with this it will help the students prepare for the challenges and opportunities of the future job market Next, enhancing stakeholder confidence. Transparent and measurable learning outcomes will build confidence among students. It also includes confidence with the parents, the employers, the teachers, and a broader community. When stakeholders see evidence of effective learning, it reinforces trust in the educational institution and they would be trusting the administration they would be more supportive of the educational institution in this sense and if the students trust this institution definitely they believe that they are enrolling there because they are learning a lot of things and that will be good for their future and of course global competitiveness nowadays Enhancing an institution's global reputation and image is very vital, especially for higher education institutions. Like in our case, since the Polytechnic University of the Philippines is a state university, we are really trying to be included in international accrediting bodies like the QS STARS rating, when recently we have three also in the QS ranking, it's in the range of 500 to 600 top university within Asia. At the same time, the Times Higher Education and the World Innovation with Real Impact, the worry, those are the accrediting bodies into which the university has put itself into a, a global competitiveness state. Measuring learning outcomes allow institutions to benchmark themselves against global standards, contributing to the competitiveness of graduates in the international job market. Next, the purpose of enhanced measurability in effective learning is to create a dynamic and responsive educational environment that prioritizes students' success, maintains high standards, and adapts to the changing landscape of education and industry. It aligns with the broader goals of providing quality education and preparing students for the challenges and the opportunities they will encounter in their future careers. Next, leveraging a single unified platform. In higher education can bring about significant advantages in terms of efficiency, collaboration, and data-driven decision-making. A unified platform in the context of the education or technology refers to an integrated and comprehensive system that consolidates various functionalities and tools into a single cohesive environment. And this platform is designed to streamline processes, enhance collaboration, and provide a unified experience for users within an organization. So let's take a look at this. In unified platform, this involves integration of diverse software applications and features into a centralized framework, allowing for a seamless interaction and data flow across different function. Like for example, the key characteristics of a unified platform are the following. Integration of multi or multiple systems. One important thing here is the learning management system or the LMS. 
This is the platform utilized by the students and educators, particularly in an online learning mode. This is where you put your lectures, your references. This is where also the students interact with you online. And do they have the ability to go back and retrieve to that after the session? Do they have the capacity to ask questions on some forum board? And do they get the chance to receive replies from their teachers? Student information system, this includes the encoding of the grades, the viewing of the grades. Can the student access it online? Can the students see their grade online? Is your institution utilizing the SIS, the student information system, or it's still is it still with the class card or the report cards that are given every quarter? Or do you have it both, a printed one together with an online information system for the students? And how do the teachers give grade? Do you have a class record that's just manually done or do you have like a template with a software into which you'll just input the scores and it, it automatically computes then later on you'll be coming up with the grades then once you have the results it will be automatically reflected into your student information system are you utilizing such things or communication tools analytics and more the goal is to eliminate data and facilitate smooth communication and data sharing between the systems. Next, a centralized data management. The platform serves as a central hub for data, ensuring consistency and accuracy among various functionalities. The centralized data management approach in avoiding discrepancies and redundancies in information, like for example, uh, the database for the students' records, the database for the teachers' records, the database for the administrative employees, right? Filing of leaves, right? Absenteeism of the students, okay? Streamlined workflows by combining various functions into a single platform. Workflows and processes become more streamlined and users can perform tasks more effectively and efficiently reducing the need to switch between multiple applications or systems. Also, improve user experience. Users, including students, faculty, administrators, benefit from a more user-friendly experience. Single sign-on accessibilities, a unified interface, and a consistent design elements would be contributing to a cohesive and intuitive user experience. Then, enhance collaboration. A unified platform promotes collaboration by integrating communication tools, discussion forums, and collaborative features. This encourages cross-departmental communication and collaboration among stakeholders. Data analytics and reporting. The platform often includes built-in analytics and reporting tools that enables institutions to gather the insights from data track performance metrics, and make informed decisions based on real-time information. As you could see, a unified platform will be very helpful in trying to observe and trying to generate necessary information which could also save your time. You don't need to check on reports, records again and again because they are already uploaded into a certain platform that you will just need to click and type to generate the information that you would be needing. Next is adaptability and scalability. A well-defined unified platform is adaptable to the specific needs of an institution and scalable to accommodate future growth. It should allow for customization and integration with external systems as necessary. Even payroll system, is it connected with the HRIS, the Human Resource Information System? Because if somebody files for a leave, then definitely uh, there could be instances that that could be deducted to what will be earned during the next cutoff. Being late or being absent, does it automatically reflect on that? That's happened. That's what's 
happens when there is a unified platform because you could trace actually what's going on. Same thing with the students. The records, did the student do well in the first semester? Could you easily access it and generate the records for that semester and compare it with the next semester? Okay, next security and privacy measures, of course, even with the use of technology, are we still able to maintain security, especially for data privacy, the concerns right now? Are there encryptions, access controls, and other security measures that the institution or your institution is able to come up with? Okay, a unified platform is strategic approach to optimize operations, enhance collaboration, and provide a cohesive and efficient digital environment for all the stakeholders in, a, in an institution, not just of a higher education institution. It aims to create a holistic ecosystem that supports the diverse needs of teaching, learning, and administrative processes within the institution. And with this, I hope I was able to share information which could be useful and which could be of something that might be of your consideration as you go along with your teaching journey so that you could become better teachers for your students. And as educators, we always have to keep in mind that it's not just our duty to teach, but it is also our responsibility to learn. And once we learn, we could be serving better for our students. Once again, thank you very much. A blessed day to everyone. And I hope we had a good discussion that we have talked about the innovative teaching techniques. So thank you very much and I hope you have learned something.